You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. For an entire generation, people have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible, on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. Now, for its 20th anniversary, the adventure of a lifetime returns to the big screen in a way you've never seen before. There'll be no one to stop us this time. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. With newly enhanced visual effects. They're coming in too fast! THX and digital sound. And a few new surprises. Hanabuki Bardonianda. On President's Day weekend, 1997, Good luck. George Lucas and 20th Century Fox invite you to welcome back Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, Darth Vader, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Chewbacca, C-3PO, and R2-D2. Finally, the motion picture event, the way it was meant to be experienced. This will be a day long remembered. As the entire Star Wars trilogy returns. On February 14th, Star Wars, followed soon after by The Empire Strikes Back. And then, Return of the Jedi. Move closer! For a whole new generation who have yet to experience it on the big screen. And for everyone else to experience it again. is our last hope. No, there is another. The Star Wars Trilogy, Special Edition. See it again, for the first time. The Force will be with you, always. everybody and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rant. My name is Carlos Perón and today we are going to be delving into an area of Star Wars that we probably haven't touched upon before and this is dealing with what media format exists out there in order to be able to see Star Wars at home. Now we read a book recently about all the different formats that are available since the beginning of the release of Star Wars, you know, back in the 70s, you know, we had different ways of viewing Star Wars at home. We've gone through 8mm, VHS, Laserdisc, Betamax, uh, Super 8mm, Sound, DVD, Blu-rays, and one of the things that is about to come out is 4K, which I believe The Last Jedi is going to be its first episode of Star Wars that is going to be released in the latest and greatest format. And versions of these films exist in many, many ways. However, if you want to watch the original Star Wars in the greatest possible way, the only thing that exists right now is DVD, believe it or not. I know you're going to say, well, wait a minute, the Blu-rays were released. Yes, they were released. The issue here is that the Blu-rays and most of the digital Star Wars versions that have been released, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, have all been copies of the special edition. Uh, That being said, the reason for it is that because back when Lucas owned, you know, the rights to Star Wars... Uh, in order to make films and the home distribution and all that material, he wanted to stop distributing the original version of the film so that when the special editions came out, it was going to be that or nothing going forward. So that brings us to 
the special edition and what kind of insane changes were made throughout the years, not only during the time of the special edition was released, but before the special edition was released and afterwards. There were also many, many, many changes. And one person took it upon himself, a fan, uh, out of the Czech Republic, out of all places, to come up with his own restored version of the film so that he can bring it back to its original contents. So in other words, no extra scenes, no changed audio, no additional dialogue, no enhanced special effects. Bring it all back to that original quality and structure when you first saw it in 1977. And that's what today's show is about. It is about the changes that were made in Star Wars throughout the years with the special edition and other releases and the despecialized edition uh, by a gentleman that goes by the name of Harmy from the Czech Republic uh, that has been and continues, believe it or not, to work on these enhanced, digitally restored uh, versions of the original Star Wars trilogy. What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You're a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That spawn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? The Force will be with you, always. Today we're going to talk about a version of Star Wars that is somewhat hard to find these days, and that is the original version of Star Wars. We've done episodes in the past where we chronicled the home video market of Star Wars and everything that was been, has been available since the beginning all the way up till about now. And we want to kind of focus a little bit on one specific aspect of that, and that is the original cut of Star Wars. Believe it or not... Today, you cannot just walk into a video store or a rental facility and rent the original or buy the original Star Wars. You have to do a little bit of detective work in order to get it. Part of the reason is because since the minute Star Wars was released, with each re-release of the film like they used to do in the past... And then the home video market versions of all these films, especially when you got to the DVD and the Laserdisc aspects of releases, Lucas has been making changes to the film for a very long time. To the point where, at first, there were very minor, minor changes. And I'm talking about the, the original trilogy here. But then in 1997, with the release of the special editions... And this was an experimental period for Lucas. He was about to kind of relaunch the entire saga and to possibly go into prequel territory here, even though officially not announced at that point. But this was an experimental period where he wanted to see how the modern special effects techniques, specifically with CGI being introduced and doing such great, great, fantastic work with films like Jurassic Park, for example, and Terminator 2, and, you know, a whole slew of CGI-heavy films, how would this affect the future of Star Wars? So this also combined with a marketing interest, the toy interests, you know, there was an audience out there that he realized that were kind of dormant for a while, since the mid-'80s, when, when Star Wars kind of went into hibernation, after the action figure line had kind of ceased to exist and the television enterprises, if you will, uh, kind of got nowhere. There was this, what is considered to be the dark times of Star Wars, where it was kind of quiet. And it was only kept alive by books and the occasional toy here or there. But then the water started to be tested out with toys, with Hasbro transitioning by purchasing Kenner and reintroducing the line all of a sudden. Later, Kenner was phased out and it was full-blown Hasbro that they were at. But in those first years of Kenner all of a sudden, you know, running around under the Hasbro umbrella with the Star Wars line, 
uh, was something that was a wake-up call to everybody. And that was yet another facet of why Lucas decided that, you know, there might be something here. It might be time to kind of rewaken this giant and see what we can do with it. And the first theatrical experiment into it was the special editions. With the special editions, he was going to do a number of things. He was going to tweak some of the technical problems that they had with the film. At the time, there were certain special effects that were not completely done exactly how he wanted them to be done. There were mistakes. If you look carefully, there were certain things that had to be fixed. Match shots, uh, composites, all types of technical visual things that didn't go exactly as they were expected. There was an overall restoration that needed to take place also. Uh, most of the negatives of the film uh, were in rough shape, so they had to restore them, uh, you know, color-wise, chemically, to be able to print in a proper manner again. This was also around the time where Laserdisc had kind of come and formed its own niche marketplace where people were watching these films now in a letterbox format. They were actually seeing the full picture, but they weren't necessarily getting it all in one shot. At first, even with Laserdiscs, you had your normal pan and scan version, but eventually they started putting out these better, you know, widescreen editions. And with the special edition right around the corner, that was another way to kind of signify that this is it. This is where we're going to kind of push the whole thing forward as much as possible and see what we can do with it. Most noticeable to your average film goer, the big deal about the special editions was that they were going to include new scenes or altered scenes. And this is really what sold you know, the country, if you will, as far as the marketing went into why this is going to work and why it's worth plunking a couple of new dollars. Now, what's interesting to point out at this time is that almost up until then, I'm, I'm going to say maybe 90% until then, the version of Star Wars that you were able to buy for home viewing was the original cut. There were some very minimal things that were changed and tweaked along the way, even before the special edition completely blew everything out of the water, there were some minor tweaks that were done that were quietly done. Uh, the most obvious one is the introduction of a new hope into the crawl. The original film didn't have a new hope. The original film was just Star Wars, period. Then they added a new hope. Okay, fine. That was a quiet tweak that was done right around the time of the first re-release. So it was uh, even before home video that was changed. You know, it was altered. Then around the time of the Laserdiscs production, I believe it might have been the Ultimate Edition or something like that. I remember I, it was the biggest Laserdisc purchase I had made at that time in terms of I think it was close to $150 or maybe even $200. Big, big, big black box. It had just about everything conceivable on it at that time. Uh, and again, this is pre-special edition. So it was just about everything they could find except for certain deleted scenes that were kept out of the general population for a very long time. But even as far back as the early 90s, when this laser disc had come out, there were already signs of other tweaking taking place. Uh, specifically, I believe it was with Star Wars, where they deleted certain shots of the detention block Imperial officers being shot, you know, hit by laser fire, and the little squib, I guess, exploding with the little, you know, pyrotechnic into their uniforms. They s took out a couple of shots of that kind of stuff, which was very minimal. Most people didn't even notice it. You had to kind of point it out to know wh what was going on. Again, very minimal. You can, you know, you blink and you miss it kind of stuff. There were a lot of audio changes through the years also with these laser discs and, you know, earlier attempts at some kind of, I don't want to call it restoration at the point because they're really not going that crazy, but it's just an unusual bunch of changes in audio that, again, most people don't notice. And it's not just in terms of adding new audio here or there, but also deleting certain lines or certain words. Very minimal 
the equivalent of blink and you miss it in the audio side. I guess you uh, you blink and you miss it. I guess that's the only way we can describe it as far as the audio goes. So then you had, like I said, the big change that came with the special editions. Once the special editions came out, Lucas would go on the record to say that this is it. This is the new version of Star Wars, and this is it. You're not going to go back and get the old ones. The old ones we already sold. They're out of the market. They're you know they're not available anymore, period. It was almost kind of like a self-imposed exile, kind of like what they used to do with the uh, Disney DVDs, where it's like they used to advertise them as, you know, we are bringing out uh, Snow White, and then it's going back in the vault forever. And you're like, oh my God, it's going in the vault. I got to get it. <laughs> it's a marketing ploy, obviously, you know, no, no big deal. You know, eventually it comes out again, Blu-ray, whatever, you know, new, new formats. They're going to pump it out again sooner or later. But as far as Lucas was concerned, this was it. They were going to do this. And throughout the years, we then got more changes. By the time Star Wars was finally put on DVD... I think it was around 2004, a couple of more tweaks were made to the film. And then later in 2011, it was put on Blu-ray. And more tweaks were done to the film. Not as extensive as during the special edition release, but noticeable more changes, sometimes having to do with the prequels now being out and kind of retroactively adjusting things so they match the prequels a little better. And throughout all this time, you know, when you buy the latest and greatest version, if you if you keep up that much, you do notice that all of a sudden, wait a minute, this looks a little different now. And what's happened is that the version of Star Wars that is most commonly sold nowadays is very somewhat different than the original. How much different? Depends on the film. Star Wars probably had the most amount of work done substituting a lot of optical photographic film effects with digital effects, uh, new scenes created, that sort of thing. Return of the Jedi probably being the second most, and Empire probably being the least, you know, that was tweaked out of all of them. But there's still very noticeable changes. Along the way, some of the fans uh, would ask, especially since these films were so widely re and re-released on home video, sometimes with no changes at all from, you know, whatever previous version was out there, sometimes with some minor tweaks here or there. But it wasn't as if there was an embargo on selling the film. The film would be sold and resold and resold many, many times. And the fans started to ask, well, why couldn't they have a version of the film that was exactly what the original was, just so it's an original version, an untouched original version of what we saw when we actually went to the movie theater back in 77 or 80 or 83. And along the way, Lucasfilm kept coming up with reasons why they couldn't do it because they didn't have this master, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. And to a lot of people, it felt a little, a little phony that there is no version of the original film that exists anymore. It just seemed as if it was just a reason because they didn't want to put it out in period and George didn't want to do it. And that's kind of him stomping his feet and saying, no, you can't have that. Eventually, they did put out something similar. And by that, I mean, they put out on DVD as a bonus disc to a yet another <laughs> wave of discs, what they consider to be an original cut. But in reality, it's something from the 90s. Uh, that came from a Laserdisc Master. So it is kind of, it is widescreen, but it's not anamorphic. And the best way to explain what something that is widescreen, but not necessarily anamorphic, is basically if you were to play that DVD on a modern television, you know, HD kind of set right now, uh, 11 by 9 aspect ratio set, you would get this widescreen look to it. However, the white screen look would be compressed into the middle of the screen uh, because it is not anamorphic. The film was not fully transferred. It was transferred within a box, you know. So it was what you were getting back then when you had Laserdisc. When we had Laserdisc, we didn't have HD sets with 11 by 9 ratio. We had regular tube sets, you know, 4 by 3 aspect ratios. So when we would watch these films at home like I've done a million times, and when we would buy 
our widescreen version, which was the thing we all wanted, and that's the reason why we all got laser discs, all of us who did, is so we can watch a wider version of a film within a 4x3 aspect ratio. Now this obviously didn't give us the full picture, uh, because we had, you know, the black bands on top on the bottom, which were basically wasted space. It was useless space, but it was a compromise that we as Laserdisc people were willing to make in order to see the additional material on the sides. So the way that we compensated, you know, for all that additional black bands on top on the bottom was by basically having larger sets. So the bigger your TV set was, the more that your actual widescreen presentation would look, even though you're still kind of relegating a lot of space to the black area on the top and the bottom. So what they then did, going back to this DVD that was put out, was they took basically the output of that laser disc. Uh, yes, it is a little better looking than your average, you know, presentation, but the aspect is all wrong. They have the right aspect, but not the right presentation. So when you play that disc on one of our sets nowadays, you know, nobody really has those old sets anymore. It looks very small. It's like I said before, it is widescreen, but it's very compressed and small into the center of your screen. But that's what you got. And that's what we were told that was only available. So as time went on, newer versions came out of the latest and greatest cut of the film. Special edition deluxe, if you will. And the current version uh, is the 2011 Blu-ray now. Uh, it is fantastic looking. It is super crisp. And sometime down the road, I'm sure they're going to do a 4K transfer, I imagine, because that's the next greatest uh, format down the line that people are starting to kind of dip into. So I would say sometime around 2010, I think it was, um, a, a gentleman from the Czech Republic who goes by the name of Harmy in the internet started putting together what's called the despecialized editions. So what he did is, with a couple of friends or a couple of internet contributors, if you will, he started scouring the world <laughs> for versions of the film that were as original as humanly possible. <coughs> and these included tons and tons of different versions of the film, you know, all the way from the latest and greatest, you know, for high definition purposes, like, you know, what we're used to seeing now, obviously, we don't want to see a, a very ugly beat up, you know, super eight millimeter version of it uh, nowadays, but something as clean as humanly possible. And his particular goals were to return the film or to be able to watch a version of the film that resembled the original cut as much as possible without all the audio changes, without all the added new scenes, without the new and deleted dialogue sections. But granted, he wasn't going to go and purposely look something whose colors were all washed out or anything like that. So there was a sense of compromise that he had to do uh, with deciding what to include and what not to include. Over the last eight years, he's been working on this and has put out a number of versions of all three films, different volumes, if you will. There was you know, 1.0, 2.0, you know, that sort of thing. And these have been available ever since he was done with whatever volume you know he happened to be working at at the time. Uh, he is currently working on a new volume of uh, some of these films because he's able to get new programs that help him kind of fix the colors a little more and you know tweak little things here or there and uh, one of the major things that he meant that that he talks about in some of the making of videos uh, that he's put out concerning his his material is that Star Wars was chosen to be in the library of congress's i don't know you know inductee films that they they're supposed to do you know a number of films and star wars was apparently one of the ones that was going to be inducted into this library of congress you know uh, library of you know the most influential films of the united states but for whatever reason lucas never submitted a copy because what they want is an original copy of the film that was originally put out and lucas now will only or at least at the time, I mean, I don't know now who's in charge. I don't know if it's Disney or who the heck knows. But he would only put the special edition and they wouldn't accept it. So as far as the historical perspective, 
you know, even for the government's purposes of education and prosperity, <laughs> they are not able to include Star Wars at this point because there is no official older version, original version that is available for anybody. Now, this doesn't mean that the work that this gentleman has done in, in terms of trying to restore the films to the original uh, content is something that would qualify these films to be able to put in because obviously there's, there's a copyright issue here, you know, that he's always trying to be careful with. And that is, uh, for him, it's kind of like a research project. He specifically says that his films are not to be sought or bought. He advises that anybody who wants to download it, they can do it as long as they already own some version of the film already. So this is really for the uber collectors, if you will. Uh, the people that are interested in more of a historical perspective, as not as much as the content in terms of entertainment value, because, you know, Star Wars is Star Wars. It's got a life of its own. And Star Wars will continue to go on no matter what anybody does or whatever cuts people make or whatever. But as far as being able to experience the film in the manner which you experienced it the first time, that's what his goal is, to be able to let you do that. And this is something that I, I remember, I, I see this all the time and it drives me a little crazy because when people reference Star Wars on television shows, for example, or award shows, even the Oscars or whatever, a lot of times you end up seeing a scene that is credited as Star Wars 1977 and you're watching special edition footage. And it's like, wait a minute, this isn't really 77. I know it's a nitpicky thing to do, but it's also nitpicky in the other way around is that you're not really showing people what you're saying you're showing them. You're showing them a fixed version of what you are meant to be showing them. So what we now have out there is a version, his version, of all three films, the original, Star Wars, Empire, and Jedi, tweaked and fixed so that they resemble as much as possible the original ones. Like I said before, there's a lot of stuff that he's still working on, that he still continues to perfect. A lot of it has to do with color. Um, the different official versions, there's slight color alterations that we don't understand if there was just an error or was done on purpose. We don't know. But let's start uh, talking about some of these uh, one film at a time. And let's begin, obviously, with Star Wars. Now, as I mentioned earlier... With Star Wars, one of the first changes they made was in that title, Crawl. They added a new hope. Uh, this is pre-digital uh, era, retconning the film so it fits, you know, for future purposes of being able to expand the franchise, obviously. So this is Chapter 4. We didn't know it was a Chapter 4 when we first saw it. It was just plain old Star Wars. They did do minor, minor changes in the actual Crawl. They actually capitalized the word Rebel, make it a little more important. And in the newer version, they also sped up the crawl a little bit more so that, that they changed the speed of the crawl a little bit more so I guess it matches the music and the transition. Now, again, some of these changes I'm going to talk about, you got to remember, originated with the special edition. But later on, more changes were done. So we are not going to go as crazy or at least too crazy in trying to credit what year a lot of these changes were done, but some of them we might have to. As soon as we see R2-D2 in Tatooine, when we're kind of tilting down from the sky to the canyons, that's been altered. The canyon itself has been done differently, so it's much sharper and, mu and with a lot more uh, hues to the canyon walls. You know, they did tweak that a lot. The sand crawler, that scene kind of uh, crawling around the dunes, was also redone for the special editions. In a later recut, uh, when R2 is hiding from the Tusken Raiders, he is uh, hiding behind some rocks as opposed to being exposed. And I guess the thinking behind that was that, you know, how could he not be seen if he's not covered? So it's, it's an interesting uh, dilemma. However, at the same time, by seeing those rocks the way you see them now, you kind of ask yourself, well, how the heck did he make himself go into that little cubbyhole in the first place? You know, because he looks like he's so tightly, you know, snuck in there now. The 
famous Obi-Wan scream. Wow. When Obi-Wan first scares the uh, Tusken Raiders off of the uh, land speeder and Luke that's laying on the floor, originally we have a scream. Well, guess what? That scream has been revamped almost with every rendition of a uh, major release of Star Wars. The last one being the most out there in terms of pitch and tone. Um, it's funny because in that scene, it's something that I almost never noticed before, but uh, you can actually see on the walls of the canyons there, this is the stuff that was shot in Tunisia, you could see writing on the walls, like somebody was drawing squares or something. And when you get to see it on Blu-ray, my God, it's so much more noticeable. Uh, the detail, it's just amazing how much, you know, high definition video g gives you a whole new world of being able to see things. We also have here a lot of new uh, landscape shots, if you want to call them matte shots, but now they're more really digital shots. And I'm talking about Ben's home. As we go to Ben's home, they changed that shot to be a more panoramic one. Same thing with Moss Eisley when they're looking over the canyon. They used a different drawing now for Moss Eisley for the entire, entire city. One big uh, new shot uh, for the special edition included the dewbacks. The dewbacks were very stationary, large animals. Not too much movement in the original cut of the film. Then for the special editions and moving forward, you have them with their stormtrooper or sand trooper on top of them. And they're walking around and moving around and growling and making noises and stuff like that. That was definitely uh, one of the big, big things that was added. And again, the things that I'm mentioning right now are also all the things that, with this specialized edition, is being removed. He is taking all these things out to bring the cut of the film back to its original nature. As you enter the cantina, you also have another do-back over there that they digitally uh, replace to make them a little more active. And there's a shot of the patrol, the stormtroopers patrolling. Also, you see the do-backs back there. You know, this is all new stuff that was added. Star Wars was probably the biggest one of all of them uh, in terms of how much new stuff they added. As we approach Mos Eisley now, we get wider, wider CGI shots of the city. You see all these little womp rats scattering, which we've never seen a womp rat before. This is all digital, obviously. Then you see these worker droids uh, slamming down a flying little robot. Again, it's supposed to be a little humor, I imagine. Uh, but it's, you know, giving you a, a bigger sense of what Mos Eisley looks like. You see street shots that we have never seen before. You see a giant Ronto creature, which is like a dinosaur thing, and some Jawas who are riding it, and then all of a sudden the motorcycle cuts them off, and the thing kind of bucks up, and the Jawas fall off the top of it, and that sort of thing. Again, another interesting, funny kind of shot. And this is some of the big selling shots I remember when they were showing the commercials you know, for these special editions coming out. It's like, well, you can now see this. It's like, oh, wow. I mean, it was, it was and it still is pretty good. You see a uh, patrol, a stormtrooper patrol, and you do see some Rontos back there also. Uh, you see the flying little droid who's flying behind the interrogator uh, stormtrooper. You know, the these are not the droids you're looking for scene. You know, they did add, you know, that flying droid. You do get the um, landscape shot also of the uh, fl of that looks like a ship, a gigantic, massive ship that's kind of half buried in the sand, and it's kind of like being used as a structure now. Uh, I always wondered about that, and that's that's the impression I got. And you do get another Ronto shot near the cantina as they're about to enter. In the cantina, one of the most noticeable shots is that they replace the character of the Wolfman, if you will. The wolfman looking creature was replaced with a different one uh, that has the this like smoking a cigar and then it has these horns and it's arguing with this tentacle thing. The infamous Han Solo Greedo scene or the who shot first scene. Well, this is a scene that since the special edition, they've been tweaking it just about every single time. Basically, what they did with the special edition is they wanted Greedo to shoot first. This way, Han Solo is not portrayed as the type of person that would shoot first. Even though it kind of fits the motif of the film. At this point in the film, it's kind of like a western. He's the good guy. He's the sketchy good guy. He's the, the clean Eastwoody, man with no name kind of good guy. He's not completely a white hat. He's more like a gray hat. 
So the initial special edition has Greedo shooting first, Han kind of ducking slightly so that the shot hits the wall. Then for the DVD release, it almost looks as they're both shooting at the same time. Then for the Blu-ray release, they made the whole thing move a lot faster, so you so it's a little harder to see who's exactly shooting at the same time. And a lot of it has to do from the backlash. The, the fans were like, no, Han always shoots first. That's Han. Uh, but, the, the, you know, again, as of the latest, they're still not willing to go all the way to the original. But this is something, obviously, that is fixed with the, the specialized editions. The uh, special edition also brought us the Jabba scene, the infamous Jabba scene that was originally shot with an actor, meant to be replaced by some kind of a, maybe a stop motion creature or something. And eventually the entire scene was dropped because it was just too expensive, too hard to figure out how to make it work. They brought it back. And because we already know what Jabba looks like at this point, what they did for 97, the special edition, was they introduced a CGI Jabba creature. This particular creature, they have the whole sequence go, him talking to Han Solo, it kind of works, it's a little clunky. The CGI looked very kind of weird, uh, especially since we know what Jabba looks like. It just didn't look like him too much, it looked a little weird. So by 2004, with the DVD release, they redid Jabba <laughs> for that scene to make him look more like the Jabba we're used to, you know, from Return of the Jedi. And to match, also, I think, the Jabba from The Phantom Menace, from that quick little shot of Jabba. And by the Blu-ray release, they even tweaked it a little bit more, not as extensively. So, you know, they're really committed into keeping this scene in, and it just keeps changing and changing. The Falcon taking off of Mos Eisley, that's been changed, you know, by adding more motion, by having a CGI Falcon. Another very noticeable change was the explosion of Alderaan and later the Death Star uh, by adding a shockwave effect to this. Uh, this is a very nice looking shockwave effect. I Originally, I remember seeing it on Star Trek The Undiscovered Country the first time they did a visual shockwave, which would look fantastic. And I guess they liked it that much. George liked it that much that he wanted to use it himself. So now it is part of every Death Star uh, exploding scene or things Death Stars explode, I guess, big planets, will include this shockwave effect. One problem that they were having also with the different versions of the release has to do with uh, colors. A lot of the colors sometimes seem to go out of whack. When Luke is practicing his lightsaber skills in the Falcon, for some reason, by the time we got, I think, to the DVD version, it looked as if his lightsaber was almost green instead of blue. And this was a problem, I guess, with the, uh, with the coloring of the film. Something went wrong, uh, which is something that in future versions, especially by the time we got around to the Blu-ray, they tried to bring it back to the blue tint that it should have. Similar lightsaber problems also happened at the uh, Obi-Wan Vader duel. Uh, there were some shots, uh, and again, these are problems that originated in, with the film, you know, back in 77, where if you look at a lightsaber pointed directly at you, it sometimes looks like just a rod, a stick. And that's because that's what it basically was. You know, later on, they colored the laser-looking optics on top of it. But there were a number of shots where Obi-Wan is fighting and you could see that it's just a plain stick. And then at the end, after Vader kills Obi-Wan and he's kind of coming forward towards everybody, but the door closes at the last minute, he is holding his lightsaber, but there is no red whatsoever on the blade. Uh, these are things that were later fixed for the special editions, uh, but removed for the these special editions which is where you kind of have to figure out where do they draw the line. At times, it looks like certain things are being kept on purpose, but then there are times where it looks like, no, they're not keeping them on purpose. They, they really want these things to, to kind of go away and go back to the original, even if the original was a defect. As I mentioned earlier, the detention block blaster shots, those were removed years ago, even before we got to the special edition. So those are pretty hard to find in the first place. 
the uh, tractor beam graphics for the special edition were changed from English to Arabesh. This way, it's a little more appropriate, I guess, because you don't see much English, you know, in a lot of Star Wars. The detention block hallway for the special edition was extended to make it look deeper because there were a little bit of a problem with the mats that they were using to make it look deeper. There were also a lot of problems with the DVDs and maybe even the Blu-rays, I'm not sure, where the blaster shots around the detention cell block area would give off this magenta flash look, which is not supposed to be that magenta. It's supposed to be slightly pinkish, I guess the flash from a laser bolt. But for some reason, again, there were some coloring problems. So this is some of the stuff that was tweaked, you know, for the despecialized edition is to kind of bring the colors back a little bit to what they originally were. The Dianoga, when we first get a quick shot of its head or its eye on the special edition, it blinks now. When Luke and Leia are about to jump from the uh, one end of the Death Star Canyon, let's say, to the other end of the bridges missing, for some reason, along the way, there are a couple of shots of Leia using the trooper blaster that sounds just like a shotgun, not a laser gun. Uh, this is something that was tweaked, again, because they somehow messed it up. For the special edition, when Solo is running through the hallway, scaring the stormtroopers and reaches the end, and there's like three or four of them looking at him and come after him. Well, for the special edition, they made it so that it's like an entire troop. You know, like at least a dozen of them coming towards him. In that same shot of Luke and Leia, before they swing over, there was an echo effect for Luke's voice that was tweaked a number of times. When we get to Yavin, first of all, the approach to Yavin, they did change a couple of the Falcon and the planet itself, you know, shots to make, you know, using CGI techniques to make it more vibrant. The actual temple, the actual hiding fortress was also CGI uh, changed uh, to make it more weathered, more old and, and like more like as it's part of the jungle. In here, uh, the special edition added a shot of Biggs that was completely not in this film, uh, where Luke meets up with Biggs. Initially in the film, Luke meets up with Biggs in Tatooine, which is completely deleted. And then he re-meets with him at Yavin 4, completely deleted. You know, we do get originally some shots of Biggs as just another pilot. But uh, here, we're kind of reintroduced to him in the shot that they use where he is kind of catching up with Luke very quickly before the battle begins, and he is introduced to yet another pilot, a more senior-ranking pilot. In the deleted scene, the pilot does mention something to Luke about him, I believe, flying with his father. His father was a great pilot, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is something that they completely removed for this scene, and uh, there's a cut point there where you can tell where it is because I think there's a droid that kind of crosses or a person crosses the, the frame. And that's how they hide the cut by having that whole chunk, you know, take place at that moment, the cut. Um, this is something they had to remove because obviously you have the prequels in the near future. And for story purposes, they don't want to have a character that is aware of who Anakin Skywalker was. It kind of could complicate things, you know, in the future. So they completely cut that scene out for, again, for retcon purposes. And just kept it with him talking to him, but not referencing his father at all. There were some shots of R2-D2, and this is something that happens on all three films that had to be fixed. Because whenever you see R2-D2 on top of the X-Wing flying in space, because a lot of those space shots are done in blue screen. Anything that's blue ends up getting washed out or discolored or potentially completely removed because the blue screen process removes the blue. Well, R2-D2's head has a lot of blue in it, has a lot of blue sections. And that is why a lot of times when you see R2 flying, he might look like those sections are black or very dark gray instead of blue. And that is part of the blue screen effect. It removes the blue. Now, on some shots, it seems as if they fixed it, digitally fixed the blue, 
And on some shots, it looks like they don't digitally fix it. They left it the way it was. So there is inconsistency up to this day still with those colors. The Yavin battle, and I can't go into detail because this is where I would imagine 75% of the effects, CGI effects, were done for the special edition, at least of Star Wars. That sequence, every, it seems as if every other shot was redone in a CGI manner. When you watch it, it works well. It flows, it moves, it's, it's not clunky. But yeah, now you have a completely different scenario you're looking at. You're not looking at the original models of the film. This is completely different now. It's good, but different. And that is a lot of the work that was done for the despecialized edition is to be able to remove all of those CGI shots and restore back the original, you know, optical model work, you know, that, that, that won all those Academy Awards back then. Through the end of the film, the Falcon arriving, redone in a CGI manner, even before they get there, the X-Wings departing, that's all new. The X-Wing formation, again, another classic money shot, if you will, of this CGI special edition. The Death Star approaching, that's all in there, that's all redone. And like I said earlier, the blast wave of the actual Death Star exploding, again, CGI, brand new. Then we go to the medal ceremony, that brings us a final shots of tweaked material this time around we have new digitally added foreground and i think maybe say even background uh, you know uh, rebels at attention as part of the contingency you know celebrating in the medal ceremony so this is what star wars gets as far as changes so the majority of what i just mentioned is what is then removed for the despecialized editions as we then move on to The Empire Strikes Back, here we have, as I mentioned earlier, probably the least amount of changes made. The despecialized edition of Empire is on its 2.0 version right now. But for the specialized edition, obviously the major changes that we were dealing with at the time was a lot of the Wampa-related material that was added in the beginning, where we see the full body of the Wampa eating, I guess, the dead carcass of a Tauntaun and walking towards Luke and that sort of thing. The Emperor's message when Vader is talking to the Emperor through the hologram was replaced between the old actor playing the Emperor and the new actor playing the Emperor with new lines, obviously. There is a number of musical cues, and just like in Star Wars, A New Hope, a lot of little audio was trimmed here or there, nothing that ridiculous. Boba Fett's voice was changed also during some of these upgrades, and then again brought back for the Despecialized Edition. There were some new shots of the Slave One flying in the, with the garbage that they have already changed and then fixed again. Cloud City, the landscape of Cloud City, there's a lot of CGI work there where we get to see all the buildings and we see the Falcon banking around, flying through the city. A lot of beautiful city shots they added to it. The actual landing sequence itself is the same, but they added more ships flying around in different levels of the air. And there's also a shot of the twin pod car flying through the city during the day and banking around the apartment buildings where Leia and Han are staying. There was also a lot of shots that were redone from inside Cloud City where we see Lando and Han and Leia and Chewie walking around touring Cloud City and Instead of the regular windows that they had before, they expanded them to make them even bigger so you can actually see some stuff going on in the background, you know, in the outside, in the clouds and the ships and, and other buildings and that sort of thing. During the scene where the Ognots are playing with the dismantled parts of C-3PO and Chewbacca's trying to get them, for some reason they also added sparks into that garbage, fiery garbage conveyor belt to make it a little more dangerous, I guess. During the escape scenes, when they're running through the holes, again, they added more sunset-looking vistas that weren't there before. When Lando exits the top port of the Falcon in order to grab Luke for the special edition, they added a secondary hatch that opens up and lets the light come in. When Luke falls through the 
wind tunnel area, let's say, the sound of him screaming is echoing through, which is a different kind of sound that we've heard before. There's a whole sequence of Vader exit in Cloud City that was never there before, which a lot of it, I believe, came from Return of the Jedi, because we see Vader exiting Cloud City. Okay, this is Cloud City looking uh, set, but then he takes a shuttle, a Tidarium type shuttle, you know, out in space towards his Star Destroyer, and the Tidarium never really showed up until Return of the Jedi, so you know where that's coming from, even though it's probably all CGI, this wasn't a deleted Jedi scene, but when he lands on his Star Destroyer and he exits the shuttle, it is so clearly the Death Star 2 that we're looking at. But they kind of shoehorn that as a way of getting Vader back to his ship. And other minimal things where I believe there were scenes where for some reason, the ranks were wrong or they were in the wrong place. So they had to reverse the location of the Imperial officer's ranks and the little cylinders in their pockets. So they did some shots where they actually replaced and reversed uh, some of these uh, bizarre rankings, which is really amazing. And these were all things that had to be fixed for the despecialized edition. For Return of the Jedi, they did a considerable amount of work one of the biggest things that you probably would remember, and again, when you look at the trailer of these movies coming out, being released, it is not so much that they're hyping up the little audio clips here or there, or the restoration of the film itself, the recoloring of the film. What they're really pushing for the mass audience is these new sequences. Well, the Max Rebo band got a very big redo here where they added characters and they replaced characters with cgi characters so like size noodles for example was completely done in cgi other characters were brought in that we've never seen before as the droids are walking towards the palace door the jabba's palace door the door now had been extended to like two three times its size and height because they wanted a more massive door all this again the specialized editions has to be reversed the song itself, which used to be called Lapty Neck, is now substituted with a new song called Jedi Rocks, which gives them a new lead singer, pretty much. A Joe Cocker type of new lead singer for the band. They actually filmed some new stuff with Ula, where she actually falls into the pit, and it's played by the same actress, you know, under a lot of makeup. So that, you know, they did extend her landing down in the actual pit. You don't see her getting eaten, <laughs> but you do see a lot more of her that you didn't see before. They added shots of Boba Fett in the background, kind of flirting with some of the singers. The carbon freezing effect, as Han is coming out of the carbon freeze, they've enhanced those a little bit now so that it looks a little different. It looks a little clearer. It looks a little more realistic in a way. We get a CGI shot of a Doug at some point. Now, again, this is some of the changes they made way later. Not necessarily for the special edition, but later after the prequels, because we see a Doug going down the stairs. And at the time, it wouldn't make any sense who this Doug is, because we've never seen a Doug before. But obviously not until Phantom Menace do we get to experience what a Doug is. Then what you have is a shot of a dewback herd that was added, obviously, to the Tatooine scene. Uh, again, very pretty, very nice. Uh, a sign of things to come, but removed for the despecialized edition. The skiffs uh, were enhanced. A lot of the, I believe a lot of the mats might have been worked on a little bit. The shadows on the sand, that could have been fixed up a little bit, just like they did for New Hope. The Sarlacc pit, oh boy. Well, with the Sarlacc Pit, what they did is they added extra CGI tentacles and an actual mouth that comes out also at a certain point. A little reminiscent of the slug creature in the asteroid belt from uh, Empire. This was, an, again, one of those big selling points when it came to uh, promoting this particular version of the special editions. At a point later on, you know, with the later, later releases, this might have been with the uh, Blu-rays. They added blinking to the Ewok, specifically to Wicket. There's a lot of blinking going on, which, again, not the type of thing you figure was needed, uh, but it kind of makes sense from a logical point of view that, you know, you need to blink your eyes sometimes, and that's something, obviously, they weren't able to do animatronically originally, I guess. Uh, so in a CGI world, they can add that kind of thing. 
Another thing going back to the uh, skiff, and it's something I've never, ever, ever noticed before, but I've always wondered about, and that is when Solo tips over, when Han tips over the, the skiff and he's hanging by his feet and Chewbacca grabs his feet, first of all, we have to remember, there's a reason why Chewbacca is not very active during this, because he's apparently wounded. Uh, this is something we f- that I found out way, 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 way later. I might have missed it. I don't know if it ever made it to the... To the novel, but the action figure that they sold from the deleted scenes uh, a very long time ago that has Chewbacca from the sandstorm scene, his legs are wrapped in bandages because apparently Chewbacca was injured, uh, I guess by blaster fire, I imagine, uh, during that battle, and that's why he's not very active. That's why we don't see him, you know, really going fighting crazy during that sequence. And what's interesting is that I always thought. Wow, Han Solo f- almost fell, and he just kind of managed to grab himself with his feet, you know, over the edge of it, and and and, and then Chewbacca is there grabbing his feet to kind of help him along. Well, what they did is to kind of enhance that unrealistic <laughs> type of dangling that is taking place. His feet apparently also kind of get caught in some of the wires that are kind of broken from the ship being, you know, hit by blaster fire. And so what they did is they digitally added wires, I guess, tangling up his feet, letting him partially the reason why he is kind of dangling upside down and not falling in with everybody else. When R2 gets short-circuited, if you guys remember, during the, the Endor battle, in one of the later editions, they added more gadgets. When he short-circuits and all his little doors pop open and all his little gadgets pop out, well, apparently they added more of them than before. Again, I would never have seen that. It's just such a fast, you know, I was never keeping track of how many gadgets were out there in the first place. Just like they did in Star Wars A New Hope, the uh, Death Star 2 blowing up is enhanced with the force wave or the shock wave effect. During the, the, the complete ending of the film, they added more Ewok campfires towards the end. During the duel at the end between Luke and Vader and the Emperor, through the different home uh, versions of the home video versions, uh, something happened with the lightsabers. Something that, for whatever reason, the whiteness, you know, the center part of the laser itself, if you will, started to take a, a, a definite shade of whatever color it was that the person was holding. So, for example, if you, for Vader's saber, you had the red, bright red outline, you know, along the edge, and that white part in the middle was looking kind of pinkish. Same thing with Luke. He had his green saber, but the centerpiece was starting to look off green. So after a couple of revisions, you know, and re-releases, they finally were able to bring it back a little more to what it should have been in the first place, and that is a more of a whitish solid color in the center. Now, I know that later on some of the lightsabers were... They futz around with them because during the prequels, the lightsabers all of a sudden developed a tip, an actual pointy tip, and I think they might have messed with that a little bit in some of the re-releases. One of the most controversial scenes is the Vader No, and that is when Luke is getting uh, hit by the Sith Lightning during the duel at the end, and Vader is trying to make up his mind or decide what to do about it. During the original film, he's just going back and forth with his head, and we see his head nodding from Luke to the Emperor, from Luke to the Emperor, that sort of thing. It happens just a few times, and then he decides to grab the Emperor and throw him over. Well, for one of these special editions, uh, I believe it was the Blu-ray one, the last one, they added a very distinctive no of Vader going, no, no, (laughs) it's pretty ridiculous, and it kind of harkens back to the Revenge of the Sith you know, you just killed uh, Padme in your rage, Lord Vader. And he's like, no, you know, that kind of thing. I I can only imagine that that is what he was trying to do in terms of tying those two movies together with the big no that sounded pretty bad during Revenge of the Sith and sounds just as bad during Return of the Jedi. After the battle and after Luke is trying to bring him back, you know, to load him into the shuttle, and they're removing the mask scene. One of the biggest changes they made was they completely CGI removed Anakin's eyebrows, because the reasoning was he was completely burned, you know, his face during the battle, 
so he wouldn't have any hair, which means he wouldn't have any eyebrows either. I understand the logic, and again, a very minor change that they made that obviously for the despecialized edition they would have to reverse. During the victory celebration, that during Return of the Jedi, we basically see Endor celebrating all the Ewoks and, you know, all the little villages up in the in the trees and the fireworks. Well, a lot of that stuff was redone. They introduced new fireworks, CGI, more realistic fireworks, if you will. We get to visit other cities celebrating throughout the galaxy. Again, another one of the selling points uh, during the trailer of this particular film we get to see cloud city celebrating and we get to see tatooine celebrating uh naboo celebrating uh, which is kind of weird because if you think about it wow we haven't even seen naboo at this point in a way but obviously the prequels is what is spurring this on and we also see coruscant celebrating again because of the prequels by the time we get to this point in the story and i'm talking about 2004 re-releases or the blu-ray releases uh, this hadn't happened around the time of the special edition because again the special edition was the guinea pig for the prequels and one interesting thing that they did uh was like i said you know for 2004 you have coruscant and naboo and for 2011 i believe what they did is they enhanced it even more by adding certain buildings that we finally did get to experience way later on so in other words for Coruscant they added the Senate building and the Jedi Temple building this might have also been done during the special editions for all we know anticipating what these buildings will look like but obviously this is something that would have to be done at a secondary round because we do have footage available of these buildings not existing or having you know the sh that panning shot of Coruscant showing you a different building and all of a sudden in a future version of it it looks more like you know the senate and the jedi temple look like so along with these changes we also had a replacement song similar to what they did at Jabba's palace here they removed the yub nub song at the end the celebration song and they replaced it with a new, more, I guess you can call it more Caribbean sounding celebration song. That's the initial reaction that I had. Again, they also included some new shots of the celebration taking place. You know, people dancing and celebrating and Ewoks dancing and that kind of thing. And the final, final change that they did to this whole thing was the shots of the Force Ghosts, which originally were the older Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Yoda. What they did here was they replaced the older Anakin with the younger Anakin, with the Hayden Christian you know, actor, Anakin Skywalker. Obviously, this happened after the prequels were done in order to give it a more retcon uh, continuity, <laughs> if you will, to what we were being presented. Now, the same argument that is made by Harmy, the guy that did the despecialized edition, still holds true as far as I'm concerned. The issue is not what Lucas has been doing with these films. The fact that he had continued to tinker with them incessantly at some point, that's his prerogative and that's his right to do as the creator of the film. Ironically, he had gone you know, uh, to Congress uh, to testify once a long, long time ago uh, when it came to the colorizing of older films uh, as a person that was fighting against, you know, the tampering of older films. I guess the caveat here is the fact that because he is the creator, he is entitled to continue to tinker with it in, you know, at nauseum at some points. Um, but Obviously, at this point, we don't know where things stand. I believe because Disney now owns these films, there is no real need for there to tinker with them anymore in the manner that Lucas was tinkering them with them in the past. Disney is not in a rush to make any sort of corrections to older films, even the prequels. I mean, don't get me wrong. The prequels have also uh, gone through a a similar uh, process than the original trilogies where not as insanely detailed and the volume of work that was done to them but for example i know that yoda who was i believe a 
puppet during the phantom menace at later versions of the re-releases of you know the home versions of the phantom menace uh, they ended up swapping it out with a digital yoda so it kind of matched a little more the type of yoda we saw by the time we got to attack of the clones and revenge of the sith so this is something that you know he is interested in doing and at least in the past i remember that when they re-released THX 1138 as a director's cut, it was under the condition that he can go in there and tweak some of the effects. And he did that. He redid some shots, heavy effect work, you know, in the CGI world to make the film a little more high tech ish, if you will. Same reasoning as before. I didn't have the tools. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the technology. So I want to do it now. And they let him do it. So it's nothing new. The issue here that a lot of fans have, including Harmony, the creator of the, these specialized editions, is that you can mess around with your film as much as you want as long as you don't purposefully hide or destroy what the original piece of art was. And that is the thing that most of us have been complaining about, is that there are so many versions out there. Where is the harm in having one version that's unaltered in its highest possible quality available. I know that the easy answer for them is to say, well, we did put out that, you know, that DVD bonus disc that had it, you know, unfortunately was not anamorphic. Well, that's the whole point. It was not anamorphic. So it was really, really not a very great item. And nowadays, I mean, Blu-ray's been out for quite a long time now. And we're moving on to 4K now, so why not put it out in a f more modern format so that film collectors and fans can have, you know, something that will last as long as everything else we own? I mean, come on, we own every conceivable copy of Star Wars, some of us insane fans. Why not give us that? So now it's basically on the hands of Disney. Will Disney want to do such a thing? Hard to say. Disney now is putting out their own plan on how to release things and what projects to pursue and what projects not to pursue. They have so many films in the pipeline that they don't really have, I think, the interest or the time to go off on these little flights of fancy of reissuing older stuff in as much high frequency as you see it in the past, you know, when Lucas had no main films to put out, how he would go back and doodle around with some of these older properties so i really don't expect it on the other hand there are rumors out there that 4k versions of at least a new hope exist and have been shown to people certain high top level people so you figure if they're in 4k they're there for a reason there was a period of time when they were going to start releasing the prequels and then the original trilogy in 3d and in order to do that i'm pretty sure they had to convert everything to this its highest digital format available for the time now i don't know if back then and i'm talking about here maybe in the last five to ten years i don't know if back then they did have that kind of high resolution or maybe the blue ray quality resolution is all that they had i don't know but i know that they did a majority of the prequels the first one did come out in 3d the second one and third one i'm pretty sure they finished them they just didn't have a mass audience to show them i think they showed one during one of the celebrations or maybe the other two or the last two were sure i'm doing celebration ex exclusive screenings but that whole thing kind of died down you know the plan to go 3d kind of went out the window once disney took over they had bigger fish to fry than to have to do a reissue of that sort of thing but in the pipeline there were supposed to be the original films too so again I wouldn't be surprised if these things are sitting in a hard drive somewhere in really, really super high quality. The question is always is going to be, where is the original cut? Has it truly been destroyed? In other words, do, do they do not exist anymore? In order to do these special editions, one of the things they're claiming is that they had to go to the original negatives and mess with them so much in order to be able to 
then upgrade them in that manner. But I honestly don't know, you know, do, do they just not exist? Were they damaged so much? Were the original negatives lost or whatever? I don't know. Part of uh, the fan community believes that he was just, he's just lying. They're just lying about it. They just don't want to do it. It's Lucas's own personal, you know, payback for the so-called fans that are so, were so critical of some of his prequel work uh, that it was kind of like him getting back <laughs> at the fans. But who knows? I have no idea. The fact that these things might already have been done and do exist, most likely, uh, leads us to believe that, who knows, maybe it is in the works someday from Disney. So in the meantime, we have Harmy's copies that are available. They're a little difficult to find. You could go to YouTube, for example, and find certain places where they will show you how to find them. There's a lot of places on the internet that will show you how to find them, how to properly download whatever version or format works best for your computer. He insists that this shouldn't be sold in any shape or form. However, there are sources out there that will charge you a fee. Now, let's be very technically clear here. They will charge you a fee in order to download it and put it on, you know, and burn it onto a disc and give it a nice packaging. So if is that a loophole? Is that a legal loophole? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it is as legal as the fact that he was able to, you know, create these DVDs in the first place, these these discs, these versions in the in the first place and give them to you in a way where you're you can watch them on your computer through opening up certain files or being able to burn them onto something. So, you know, you think about it, it's like, well, you know what, if I don't own a burner, a Blu-ray burner, how am I supposed to be able to have a copy, you know, that doesn't just live on the computer? So there are options out there. Let's put it that way. There are options out there. Ironically, he is still working on future versions of some of these films. For some reasons, there are apparently new ways of color correcting or enhancing the images that he already has. And currently he is in the process, I believe, of starting a 3.0 version of A New Hope. Or, in his case, Star Wars. <laughs> there is no New Hope in Star Wars. Not in these, under these specialized editions. Is he becoming a little bit like Lucas in terms of he can't stop fiddling with it? I don't know. It's it's a fine line between obsession and that sort of thing. There's a number of interviews on YouTube, and I'll put some links, if possible, uh, interviewing uh, Harmy and, and, you know, the fact that he wasn't a film restoration specialist to begin with. He kind of sort of became one a little bit at a time by being able to work on this hobby of his. But it is ironic that he continues to play with it. He even admits that he would wish that Disney would just put out a version, you know, high quality original version. This way he can stop making these because it is taking up a lot of his time, which is uh, it's pretty funny how the hobby is taking over his life and all of his time. And I can sincerely relate to that <laughs> as we put together our current show. But uh, it is, I believe, something that belongs in the overall the overall pantheon of collecting Star Wars, you know, if, if depending on what your thing is, what is your focus that you collect? You collect your figures, you forget, you collect your posters, you collect your soundtracks, you, you know, you collect your media, your DVDs, your VHSs, your laser discs, whatever it is that you're into. This is one of those products that I think belongs in your collection in some shape or form because. It is part of the whole world of Star Wars, even the world of Star Wars that's kind of off to the side, you know, behind the dresser, hiding in the corner. Uh, this is kind of like, for example, owning a copy of the Holiday Special or even the Ewoks uh, movies or, you know, all those bizarre other offshoots of Star Wars that are not necessarily directly Star Wars, but they're connected in some way. And in this particular case, it is hard to believe that these original cuts are not so easily accessible in the greatest possible quality available. Granted, 
you want to take a quick little shortcut and if you don't mind quality or aspect ratio or anything of that sort yes you can try to find those bonus discs you know edition dvds or heck you can go and buy a vhs copy if you happen to have a vhs machine left in your house i don't know how many vcrs are being sold recently but you know for people that are into the greatest and most you know pristine advanced look of films this is one amazing option if you have the means to acquire it well, I hope everybody enjoyed today's topic. You know, we did go the Star Wars route again. And uh, this is a subject that we hadn't uh, covered in this much detail in the past. The topic of home video and all the different versions that are out there that exist that are continuing to come out. You know, with the change over now to... 4k from the departure or alleged departure of 3d blu-rays that i'm very upset about that we're seeing less and less and i don't know if they're gonna bother to put out a 3d version of for example the last jedi even though that is definitely not one of my favorites but that's a whole other rant and another episode to talk about you know we don't know what direction this whole thing is going so if you ever wanted to kind of go back to the original original experience of seeing this film for the first time in the theater the special effects the sound the music all those things that are award academy award winning and many other awards uh you have to do a little bit of detective work you know to be able to experience what those things are because they're slowly being kind of erased from history because the media just doesn't exist anymore people don't have how many people have vhs machines anymore who the hell knows but by being able to get your hands on some of these despecialized editions, you can kind of go back and get a feel of, wow, that's what those original things look like. That's what the whole optical printing process looked like. It wasn't perfect, but heck, for its time, it was cutting edge. So, on behalf of everyone here, thanks for listening, and we will see you soon here at GeekFest Friends. Bye-bye, everybody. Somewhere in space, this may all be happening right now. 20th Century Fox and George Lucas, the man who brought you American graffiti, now bring you an adventure unlike anything on your planet. Star Wars. Here they come. The story of a boy, a girl, and a universe. It's a big, sprawling space saga of rebellion and romance. It's a spectacle, light years ahead of its time. I am C-3PO, human-cyborg relations, and this is my counterpart, R2-D2. Hello. 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 It's an epic of heroes. Good luck. And villains. And aliens from a thousand worlds. in the making and it's coming to your galaxy this summer if you would like to subscribe to our show send us messages or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our youtube channel facebook page or itunes at geekfestrants I don't know what we're yelling about! Geek Fest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2018. <laughs>